Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. My name is Anthony, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Anthony. <laughs> Always nervous when I come up here. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I did a talk like this last fall about in uh, September, and uh, my family and I were moving in July. So I, I wanted to do one more before I left. So I, you know, I told Greg and Eric, uh, it's like, you know, if that were possible, please put me on the list. And they said they would, but they were pretty booked up. But if someone drops out, then, um, then they would put me on. And then not a week went by, and someone was unable to do it. And that night was tonight. And just as luck would have it, tomorrow is my two year sobriety birthday. So So, uh, you know, through the grace of my higher power, my family, uh, namely my wife and AA, I will, unless something goes off the rails tonight, uh, I'll be so two years tomorrow. So, you know, I say grace of a higher power that, that word grace always sounded very religious e to me and always kind of freaked me out, to be honest. Um, then I looked it up. What it means is the spontaneous, unmerited gift of the divine favor and the salvation of sinners. I mean, a more simplified way to say that is someone is looking out for me or something is looking out for me. So as I go on, you know, there's some grace. Maybe, you know, I used to call it good luck and bad luck, but I'm thinking now that it might have been grace. So, you know, I'll start by talking about what it's what it was like, um, just kind of background and qualifications. Um, <clears throat> my my mom was very much an addict and an alcoholic. She was in and out of jail uh, most most of my life, or most you know uh, while she was still alive. And I was raised by my grandma, and didn't meet my dad until much later. Um, but I was raised by my grandma, and you know. All kind of throughout my childhood, middle school, those kind of things, I kind of felt, you know, I, I didn't feel like completely different. I was able to make friends and those kind of things, but I always felt super anxious, um, cared what people were thinking about me, like making up these delusions in my head that people were talking about me and, you know, those kind of just not feeling like I fit in, felt like I was kind of on the outside and, you know, just kind of focused on what I didn't have instead of what I did and how I related to people. And when I was about, I think I was a sophomore in high school, so I was about 14 or 15 is when I first, um, you know, had a drink with my friend. It was like 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, it was uh, this butter, butterscotch snops that, um, that, that his uh, parents had in their liquor cabinet. And uh, I still can't smell that today. I hate butterscotch now. Um, we, we drank a whole bunch um, and, you know, proceeded to get completely messed up and then my grandma came and picked me up afterwards and uh as we were driving i was like oh, she's like you don't look well and i was like oh yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sick like i i told her we were playing like uh football you know pick up game of football so i was like oh, i got hit in the stomach really hard and that's what's wrong with my stomach so when i threw out threw up out the window and it smelled like butterscotch that was the reason right <laughs> so just right away i was just kind of lying about what you know happened trying to cover up my tracks so <laughs> not a good start um, you know, and but the point was like, I stopped caring what people thought once I, once I had that drink and, and I was able, at least I felt like I was able to live in the moment instead of always worrying about what's happening next or what happened in the past or what I could have done differently. I could just be like, take a breath, you know, just relax. So, you know, right, right away, I, I didn't drink like other people. I was always, you know, up until the last beer was drank. Um, always the last one awake at a party, always trying to get more, those kind of things. Um, you can rally those, <laughs> that type of style. Um, and I always wanted to do it. Always wanted to do it. Like, you know, at first it was just weekends and then it was every day. And then, you know, and sooner or later, sooner than later, consequences started building up. You know, I won't get into all the drunk a lot about it, but you know, I, I got an early DUI when I was like 17, so fortunately for me, it's juvenile record is you know like sealed away. But 
nonetheless, like early, right away, you would think like, hey, maybe this is a wake up call. Maybe I should, you know, tone it down a little bit before I ruin my future. But instead, I had a diversion officer. And one time I, I got so drunk the night before that I was still drunk when I met with my diversion officer. And he had me blow into a breathalyzer and you know, it was pretty high. And so I had to spend a couple of days in jail because of that. I was 18 at that time. Now, I only say these things to talk about the insanity, right? Like, I know I had to meet my diversion officer. I knew I had this coming up, but I decided to get drunk at the exact wrong time, right? And I thought I could control it. I was like, well, I'll just have a few tonight. I'll be fine by the morning. But the problem is, once I have one, I can't stop until it's gone. So, you know, and there was other things that happened throughout that time period. Like, it was kind of how I dealt with trauma. Um... When I was around 16, my, my mom came back into my life as like a trial basis. She and I lived together. My, my grandma went and lived with an aunt. Um, that soon became a party house where everyone came over and she bought beer for us, which was great at first. And a couple months into it, you know, between her disease and my disease, you know, it, it got, got pretty bad. Um, there was one night where it got, like, she got physical with me and like held me by my neck and held me down. Um, and I left afterwards and kind of stayed on couches until then. So things were going downhill and downhill fast is the point. So I knew I had to get out of there. So this was my first geographical relocation to get away from the situation and what I was becoming. So I decided to join the Marine Corps. Whoops, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, man, I, once I have this, you know, the structure and duty and all this other stuff, I'll be fine, right? Turns out, you know, Marines tend to drink a lot. Um, so I got in trouble right away, right after boot camp. Um, it took me a long time to go from a private to a private first class, I just put it that way. Um, you know, and it started to become like when I drink, like I couldn't predict when I would black out. Like I remember this one time we, I was stationed in California and we, we went upstate to San Francisco and all I remember was like, you know, checking into the hotel with my friends and we like went out to this pool bar, um, billiards bar. And, you know, I had a drink and that was, I don't remember anything after that. But I woke up the next morning to a hotel bed that had glass all over it, shattered glass. I had no idea what happened. And I, I, I look around the room and it turns out there's just this huge mirror like frame, like over here beside the bed. And I don't know how it got shattered. I assume I did it, but there's nobody else in the room. Um, so we went up there as a unit and I went back downstairs and I was like, all right, we're leaving on the, you know, on our bus soon. So I was like, oh, let's just get out of here. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And, uh, I asked the lady, I was like, what, what's taking so long? What are we waiting on? She's like, you, you're the reason why we're you know, it's, you know, what's taking so long and just like the judgment and like the shame I felt from that. I don't remember anything. You know, for the longest time I was like, somebody must have put something in my drink because all I had was one, all this other stuff. And you know, that's not true. It's not true. I just couldn't predict when I could handle a drink and when I couldn't. You know, and some, I had some uh, health issues from it. Not like I didn't have, fortunately I didn't have like any kind of liver issues that I know of. Um, <laughs> It might have just healed itself, and I didn't check it out. But um, I started getting these like anxiety attacks and panic attacks, uh, you know, when coming off of coming off the booze. And you know, the first time, I just couldn't get it right, and someone took me to the hospital, and all they did was sit me in a bed, hook me up with an IV, and just ignored me for three hours. And <laughs> once I calmed down, they let me go, and I realized what it was. And you know, then each time I had a panic attack after drink, you know coming off of the booze. I just kind of try to ride it out, but it wasn't the last time, not for a while. So, you know, I, for whatever reason, I was two and a half years out of the four, um, in the military and I was still a private. I got like three NJPs, which is just like their version of punishment. Um, for those who don't know, but you know, I was still able to work. I was really good at my job. Like it was just outside of my job that it was bad. But, so I was able to turn it around. I was able to turn it around and become a corporal um, before I got out and got an honorable discharge somehow, some way, and was able to complete those four years. And I kept thinking to myself, I was like, you know, 
I've never been a prayer. I've never been religious. But at these points, I would be like, God, please just get me out of here with an honorable discharge so I can, you know, further my life through college and these kind of things. And I'll tone down, I swear. And, you know, I, I did. I got accepted to undergrad because I had the GI Bill and, you know, guaranteed money can overlook a okay GPA in middle, in middle school and high school. So I went to the University of Colorado. So I was like, all right, now I'll tone down, right? And, um, you know, I decided to go pre-med. Um, you know, I never, never thought I wanted to be a doctor growing up. But once I started doing college and realized that I could do it, it wasn't, you know, I was able to take what I learned from the military, that perseverance and just kind of like pushing through hangovers, honestly, and be able to set my mind to it. And that's why I decided what I wanted to do. So throughout, throughout college, you know, to more consequences happened. I got another DUI, um, you know, and I think the worst part though, was like, I started to alienate some of my closest friends. Like I was roommates with a lot of friends from high school that knew me from back then. And, you know, they were getting sick of dealing with my shit, honestly. Um, man, I was trying not to cuss. Oh, well. um, all right. Uh, so, you know, they were getting tired of dealing with it and either way, the point is like somehow, some way I got into medical school and it was one of those again, I was like, God, Get me into medical school. I swear I'll cut down. Didn't happen. So I got into medical school and, you know, this time, you know, it, it's excusable to drink like I drink. Excusable. Um, when you're in the military, when you're in undergrad, because a lot of people do that. You know, a lot of people, problem drinkers or have like an acute version of what we have all the time, uh, where, you know, they drink to excess and, uh, and have consequences and those kind of things. But, you know, something, whatever it is, whether it be a job or they just grow out of it or family member or a relationship, usually grow out of it and can stop. I couldn't. So, you know, in medical school, what happened was that I, uh, I started to isolate more. I started to, uh, you know, drink alone a lot because they didn't party like I partied. So, and that got pretty bad. So most of the time I was just, you know, drinking in my apartment. I was like, I'm not hurting anybody, you know, just myself. So that, that was, uh, you know, <clears throat> fortunately around that time, um, I, I met someone, uh, I met someone in Wichita, Kansas. She's my now wife. Um, I met her at that time and I was able to hide some of that because I was always work hard, play hard. And, you know, I had to decide what to do. Um, when I would go off to residency, which was also in Colorado. So I would either have to take her with me and let her, you know, take the, take the chance of her seeing the side of me. But, you know, I knew she was the one for me. So I wanted to do that. So going into uh, residency, she did see that I couldn't hide that work hard, play hard, like division that I had between my lives. And, you know, things got things, you know, meshed together and, you know, it started to affect my relationship with my wife and my stepson. So, you know, I just kind of tore that relationship apart. I was always frustrated. I was always angry most of the time because I was hung over and I, all I cared about was like getting to the next drink. I didn't want to hear anything else, you know, and it wasn't always bad. I wouldn't always go to excess. I would try to moderate and those kind of things. Like we had a deal basically where it was just like six beers is going to be my max. Okay. Most people would say that's a lot. That's, that's actually <laughs> defined as binge drinking, but six beers would be my max. And you know, sometimes I would stay to that. Sometimes I would even stay to like two or three. And, but the difference is, is that my brain would just be on fire from it. I was like, <clears throat> just, okay, I did it. I'm using all my concentration for it. But inside, I was just like, man, I wish I didn't have to do this. I wish I didn't have to do this. And that was all I could think about until the next time when I could drink a little bit more, you know, liberally. So not only that, but multiple times, like most of the time, I should say, like when, after she'd go to bed, I... You know, would find one reason or another to either walk to the gas station or get another beer that's in the house or something along those time lines. 
we would homebrew, so there was like a big box of crappy beer. Um, <laughs> it was very good. Um, we used to say it was, but it, it wasn't. Um, but I, I, you know, I'd find a reason to drink it, right? I would talk myself into it. I would say, I'm not hurting anybody. It's just me sitting on this porch, watching something on my laptop. Who am I hurting, right? And the truth was, I was, I was hurting everybody. So, you know, to backtrack a little bit, um, I said my mom was in and out of jail and stuff like that throughout my life. And she was always this kind of like benchmark of what not to be. So my moral code was like, don't be like her, basically, right? And that's what I was becoming. Because what the biggest thing was, I was choosing this, this alcohol, you know, my substance of choice, um, over my family, over my job, over myself. And I couldn't, I couldn't lie to myself, but I would anyway, and say that it was just me. So, and each, each new, like, moral code, like, compass, like, all right, I won't go lower than this. Then I won't go lower than that. I won't yell at a, at a kid, my stepson, right? because of some dumb thing that annoyed me. But I did that. I did these things, you know, <clears throat> and just kept getting worse and worse. And then until finally, you know, I remember, I remember leading up to my personal bottom was like, it's going to be real sad when I'm going to be that person at the bar being like, Hey, I was a doctor until I wasn't anymore. You know what I mean? And telling that story. I did not want to become that person, but I knew it was going to happen. Instead of stopping, I was just like, you know, I'll keep riding it out as long as I can. So one night, um, <clears throat> it was just a night like any other. Um, things got, you know, I drank more than I should. My, uh, my wife and I argued about it. And, you know, long story short, basically she feared for her safety. That's a, that is a moral bankruptcy that I never thought, you know, I would cross. That was a line, you know, and it wasn't the first time. This time, though, she, you know, called the cops on it. The cops took me away. It was, uh, it was a Thursday night, and I had to work the next day, so that's not great. Um, so I, I'm in the cell. I'm in this holding cell with all these other people the next day on Friday. And because I didn't blow zeros in time uh, to see the judge on Friday, I had to stay off the whole weekend, and I was supposed to work all weekend. So I'm like, I'm screwed. It's over. Everything is over, right? And I'm just sitting there, just kind of wallowing in it in this holding cell. And I remember, I remember turning over to the wall, just trying to ignore everyone, just curl up under the like sheet that I had, um, and using my arm as a as a pillow. Um, and I saw this red bloody booger on the wall. <laughs> yep. That's where my life was. It was a very fitting symbol. Um, and I was just like, all right, so I'm going to turn back the other way. And there's a toilet right there, and somebody's using it. And I was like, I'm going back to the bloody booger. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's where I was. And then, you know, this is in, during the COVID time. So, um, so it's me and two other people in the cell. Those two people uh, made bail. And... You know, I was just sitting there by myself for 23 hours a day for the, the next couple of days. And I remember thinking, like, part of me was just like, God, I hope they don't put anybody else in the cell. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just thinking of, you know. But most of that time, though, I was just wallowing in self-pity. Like, I can't believe this happened. Like, it wasn't even why me or anything like that. I accepted, like, I did this. I'm the reason I'm here. And, you know, that really broke me down. And I think that's, that's what allowed me, you know, to come into these rooms later. But it didn't happen immediately. So when I got out, for whatever reason, I got lucky enough to, um, you know, I was able to talk to my wife. And she didn't want to press charges. And things were just dropped. Very fortunate. Um, and then with my work... I met with, uh, I was in residency, so I met with my program director, and he was basically like, yo, you have to go to this, like, this basically this company that helps, you know, physicians with substance abuse problems. You go do that, you get evaluated by them, you do whatever they say, and you'll be good. So, I was like, all right. So, I, I, I'm getting away with it. And so, I have a fork in the road. I could either do what they tell me, my wife can take me back. Or I can just go on to the bitter end, as they talk about in the book. And that fork, it was very hard. 
It was very hard to decide. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Like, on paper, it's a very easy decision. And right now, it's a very easy decision. <laughs> but at the time, I couldn't decide between these two, uh, these two roads. And, you know, <clears throat> for whatever reason, this image popped up into my head. It was just me, face down, on this bed, and just empty beer bottles all around in this, ho- like, crummy hotel. And I saw myself there. And I knew that that was a reality that I could easily meet, not very soon. And for whatever reason, that scared me enough that I was like, all right, I'm just going to do what these people say. Um, just count my blessings and just uh, get, you know, until they're off my back. And then, then we'll talk about going back to moderating, right? I'd always planned to go back out. I wasn't ready yet. So the next four months, you know, for the most part, I had to meet with the therapist. Um, this was a therapist I had already been seeing because, like, I thought the root problem was depression, um, and I was never, like, totally honest with the therapist, because none of us are, right? Poor guys. Um, guys and gals. But anyway, um, that was part of it, and I had to go to these online Zoom AA meetings. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm a talkative person. I, I open up and share with people, but I never really let the message kind of sink in. And those four months, it took about four months of going to these things, and you know, trying to be sober, and I was miserable, miserable. I, um, <clears throat> I was white knuckling it. I was angry all the time. I couldn't really enjoy much. Um, I like one of my favorite things to do is to go to uh, stand up comedy shows, and like we went to one in the first couple months, and it was just not fun. It was in a bar, and it was just like it's not funny. I don't know why I felt like self conscious, like I couldn't laugh at a comedy show, which is absurd. But um, yeah, I was like. This is what my life's going to be like now. I, it's like I'm just carrying these chains with me, right? Like I'm Jacob Marley, just kind of carrying these chains through life of, you know, just doing what everybody says. So it, it got to the point where it's just like, I feel like I can't live sober. And I know I can't go back to drink because I know what's going to happen. So, you know, I brought it up to to my wife because there was like this, possibility of me getting off the monitoring and peeing in a cup um, as part of it. I forgot to mention that, where, where I had to pee in a cup uh, and they would see if I was drinking or not. Um, and there was a possibility of me getting off early. And I was like, so once I get off early, right, what if we go to like bar trivia or something and just have a couple, you know? And that led to an argument, understandably, right? Because <laughs> it's like, are you serious? Like, right when you're off monitor, you're going to go back to it? How does this show me that this time's going to be any different? And, you know, it started an argument, and I was fuming. And it was right before uh, my Zoom AA meeting. And, you know, and I remember I said to I said to her, I said, I, I just want to be able to drink like a gentleman. I said that. And I had no idea this was a thing that we say here in AA all the time. Yeah. Um, but that night, somebody else said that, those exact words. And for whatever reason, that sunk into my head. And I heard what happened when they went back out and tried to quote drink like a gentleman or moderate, however you want to say it. Um, and it went very poorly. And the next person shared theirs and the next person shared theirs. And I was like, I think somebody's trying to tell me something. So before I could stop myself, cause that's the key is action, right? I had to act before I could think about it any further. And I reached out to, um, someone who was talking and because honest, because I respected them and they want, they had something that I wanted, just kind of this calm presence and those kind of things. And I reached out to him. I was like, Hey, do you want to meet and talk about sponsorship? And he said, sure. So, you know, we decided to meet for coffee a couple days later. And the whole time I was like, how do I get out of this? I can't believe I said I would do this. <laughs> and I told, yeah, I, I was like, I can't go. I have to find some reason because I don't want to waste this person's time um, by him sponsoring me and me thinking in the back of my head. I was like, I'm going back out. That's the way I thought. And I was just like, for whatever reason, I just kept it. And I, and I met with him. He told me his story. I told him part of mine and kept it very simple. It was just like, you know, you got to check in. Each day, just a text. We don't have to have some long conversation. Just check in so you get used to talking to other people when you need to. And so, you know, if something were to happen, then you won't feel, like, shy about it later, basically. And you need to go to in-person meetings. 
hopefully a couple times a week. Like he knew, you know, I was a resident. You know, everyone's busy, right? There's no excuse. Um, I had to go to a couple meetings in person. So I did it. I went to a couple meetings, <clears throat> sorry, a couple meetings in person. And it was like, it was like this, this was heavy. <clears throat> I'm not going to choke up, I swear. <clears throat> uh, anyway, <clears throat> it was like that, he- those heavy chains that like fell off. I, I don't know why. I didn't want to look at it. <laughs> I don't want to look, look a gift horse in the mouth, but. I just felt a relief, like, I heard other people talk, and I related to them, and and maybe decided to keep on going with it, just a little bit at a time, like, talk about one day at a time, for me, it was one step at a time, so, step one, just admitting, and also knowing without a doubt that each, what would happen if I drank again, and that I was truly insane from this disease, from alcoholism, why, you know, there's, bunch of theories out there. There's, you know, there's plenty of evidence out there that our brains respond to our drug of choice, whether it be alcohol or any kind of substance where we have like a larger release of endorphins and yada, 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 all this biology that comes with it. That could be why it could be that both my parents, you know, were raging alcoholics. It could be, you know, just society in general, um, you know, promoting alcohol and those kind of things. Maybe, maybe a combination of all of those things, but it doesn't really matter because I am what I am, right? So I had to admit that. And the biggest part was for, you know, is that I couldn't do it myself as much as I wanted to will it to happen, as much as I tried to moderate and everything like that, like I couldn't do it myself. I thought I could, I, you know, I tried to use like, oh, I'm a doctor. I should be able to figure this out, right? I know the physiology of the disease. That doesn't mean anything because, yeah, I needed help. I needed outside help, something that was outside of myself. So what would that be? I told my sponsor right away, step two and three are going to be a problem because I have an issue with the God concept. He's like, okay, we'll get there when we get there. I was like, I'm just letting you know. He's like, okay, we'll get there when we get there. So, you know, and your own conception of God was huge, huge to me, or of a higher power. For me, um, you know, I'm a big believer in evidence-based medicine. So, like, research and studies that show that something is more effective than another thing. Through my own, you know, looking through it, there are studies that came out about AA and other 12-step programs, like NA and those kind of things. And head-to-head, it showed that AA was more effective than other types of treatment for this disease. You know, those other types of treatment are helpful. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm just saying that it's been shown that AA is more effective at keeping people sober for longer and more abs- more days abstinent. That was enough for me. That was my higher power. I was like, okay, I can get behind that. So I used the program as my higher power, and I was willing to, you know, do the next parts, do the action parts of this program with step three. Now, step four, everybody's afraid of step four where we take our moral inventory, right? <clears throat> but, you know, it's the way my sponsor described it to me is that it's not your life story. He doesn't want to hear it for, for my sponsor. He doesn't want to hear your life story. That's what this is for. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's not about that. It's about looking at things in your past, your resentments, um, whether they be justified or unjustified. And looking at who it is, what happened, your part in it. So I did that. I just wrote, we, you know, put down three columns. I filled them out and I looked at my part in all of those. Even like, for example, an unjust, you know, what could be considered a justified one with, uh, you know, my mom choosing drugs over me and leaving me at an early age. Some would consider that justified. Maybe. But what's unjustified is how I let it affect me later how I let it stop me, use it as an excuse to trick. I let it stop me from having relationships with other people. That's on me. She didn't do that. I did that. So, you know, and after writing them all down, there is a key thing. And the theme is selfishness for me. Um, I'm a very selfish person. And, you know, <laughs> I've been through, uh, through it a couple times and it seems like it, that's a, a runny theme amongst us. But, uh, yeah, I, Knowing that and then expressing it to my sponsor, it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't. 
a lot of people I hear, you know, like still waiting to do my step four and taking time to do it. You know, <clears throat> I'm, there's no right or wrong way to work the program as long as you work the program, right? This way worked for me, and that, that's all I'm sharing. Um, that when it's putting down like that, here are the facts, and just looking at it as the facts, that worked for me. So, you know, moving on to six and seven, honestly, I used to, we just flew right past these. These are the flyover steps. There's two paragraphs in the big book about them. Um, entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character and humbly and asking him to remove our shortcomings. I was like, yeah, sure. Remove my selfishness. Okay, next one. Let's, let's start working on this list. <laughs> it was fine for the time because how are you going to do it more? So I didn't learn until, shoot, recently, in the last few months, like how that this is an action step. I needed to go back and like look at those shortcomings and those deep defects of character, like selfishness, my negative thinking, my pessimistic attitude, how my anger, my frustration, like quick temper, all those things they are a constant battle. Yes, I use the other steps to try and help those things, but specifically working on those, <clears throat> asking for them to be removed. Now, I, every morning, I have to ask for those to be removed, or at least try. And sometimes I have to do it throughout the day because I feel those building up where I'm frustrated by something that happened at work, something doesn't go my way. It, it usually revolves around something that doesn't go the way I think it should go, right? Trying to control things, trying to fit things in the perfect hole or box or whatever you want, whatever you want. You get the point. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, step eight and nine. So we make a list of all the people we've harmed and, been, and became willing to make amends to them and then making those amends. Most of them went well. You know, it wasn't easy all the time. Some of them I couldn't wait to do because I wanted to mend some relationships. I wanted to get, fam you know, people had relationships with my family back. Um, some were a surprise, you know. There was one, uh, the first one I did was a huge surprise. Uh, and it turned out, like, basically what happened was, was <clears throat> I went there just to be like, hey, man, sorry for getting drunk and having to pass out on your couch was what I thought it was going to be. And he goes, do you know what happened that night? I was like, yeah, I passed out on your couch. He's like, no, like you got violent. You like you helped me up against the wall and like a neighbor came out and you were ready to fight them and all this other shit. And I was like, I don't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. I'm so sorry. Like, so, you know, there's some surprises and, you know, I knew I was doing the right thing. And. You know, it ended up going well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he didn't forgive me. Nobody's, you know, doesn't mean we're going to be best friends afterwards, but he accepted <laughs> my men's and was happy I was getting help. And the other people I told about it, you know, I was like, hey, I'm in AA and as part of my reco recovery program, I want to, you know, address this and figure out how I can mend this relationship. And not one of them was like, oh, you're an AA? I'm super surprised. No, not a single one. They're all like, yeah, good. I'm, I'm happy for you. You really need it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, getting through all those, I mean, going through step 10, continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So, you know, I think we do all the steps, or me personally, I think I do all the steps all the time, kind of like as they come, I address it this way. I'm going to step four that one. I'm going to step five that one, those kind of things. Um, but step 10 is very important to me um, because in that paragraph, it tells you exactly what to do when those feelings start to rise up, whether it be frustration, anger, depression, all those kind of things. In the moment, it says to watch for those feelings rise up. It says ask them to be taken away and then turn your thoughts to someone you can help, preferably an alcoholic. They're not always available, surprisingly. It does seem like there's a lot of us, but they're not always available. Um, and just turning to help anybody, whether it be a family member or someone at my work or something along those lines, the point is to get yourself out of yourself. That's what helps me. And by the time I get back to whatever was not at me, it's either not a big deal and it just goes away, or there's an obvious solution, or either way, I'm not letting it affect me and my state of mind for that day. So step 11, <clears throat> prayer and meditation. Meditation has been super hard for me. Um, it's hard to stay still and those kind of things. But, um, you know, 
I try and I'm, you know, I try to redouble my efforts. I'm finding it's working, um, keeping me kind of overall even keeled. But, you know, it's not easy and it's not easy for me to go about praying, but I'm trying it, I'm trying it. Step 12 is my favorite because it's about sharing this message. So that can mean anything. Like, I remember, so my sponsor is here. I'm not going to call him out. Um, anyway, uh, so I remember, like, when I first, like, wanted to get, you know, I was, like, done with the steps, like, time to go get a sponsee, right? And we're about to have a baby, which I'll get into later. Um, and it's just like, huh, should I do this? Like, I'm about to be swamped with, you know, having a baby and all, and I have work and I have all these excuses and all this other stuff. But I was also super worried and anxious about having a baby and these kind of things. So I just did it. And it was, it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Like, not only do I get to take my sponsor through the steps and watch his life change, it helps me to get me out of me. And, you know, it just made, I don't know. I'm very grateful for you. Let's just put it that way. Um, and, you know, it helped me grow a lot more because I was able to think about somebody else using that, you know, step 10, like in a perfect example. So, and if I'm not able to do that, if I don't have a new sponsee to work with, because it doesn't always work out between me and a sponsee or, you know, you know how it goes, but, um, it's helping a newcomer that's there. Sometimes I'll give somebody a ride home. You know, a lot of us come in here without driver's license, right? I know that. So <laughs> giving a ride home if, you know, if one is wanted, especially if it's raining outside or something like that, or helping somebody with cards, you know, getting phone numbers, those kind of things, getting myself out of myself always seems to help. So with the higher power thing, um, since, you know, since I even last year or the year before, my concept of a higher power just kind of has been molding and molding and molding. So, you know, Merriam Webster's definition of God is a supreme reality, not like a specific religious God, but I like that supreme reality. I think of it as being on the path of a being, right? And when I, when I picture it, you guys probably don't care, but that's all right. Uh, you have to listen to me anyway. So, um, <laughs> you know, on windy days when the clouds are just kind of like going one direction, right? It almost looks like they're following a beam. And the way I see it is the universe just kind of going in this forward direction. And it's my job to hop on, hop on that train that's going that direction. And I notice that when I try to control things and when I, <clears throat> you know, am in conflict with other people or myself or anything like that, I'm off that beam and I have to get myself back on it. So that, that has become what my definition of a higher power is now. So, you know, I was on that monitoring <clears throat> where I was peeing in a cup and that was a great safety net. I know <laughs> for people that are still on it, it does not feel like it. It's a pain in the butt, cost money, all these things. But if it wasn't for that, there's no way I would have stayed over those first four months. No way. I have no doubt in my mind that I would have found a way around it and continue drinking and who knows where I'd be now. So I'm grateful for it. I did get taken off early and I was really afraid about that, about that, right? Before I moved here about a year ago, um, they're like, well, since you're moving and things are going well, we'll, we'll take you off. And like, man, my safety net is gone. Like, it's just going to be on me now. <laughs> so I doubled my efforts. I like, <laughs> Kept going to meetings every day, talking to more people. Um, there's things that I do to try and stay in the program. That's, you know, listening. For me, it's uh, listening to podcasts on the way to work. Podcasts related to sobriety. It's usually open talks, which is why I wanted to do this again, because open talks have been such a huge part of my sobriety. and It's been so helpful to me. So I just only want to give that back just a little bit. Going to meetings as much as I can. Talking to newcomers, like I said, sponsoring people. And things that make me uncomfortable, like going to a barbecue here at the Alano and talking with a bunch of people. Um, <clears throat> you know, like my first initial thought, sorry, Greg, uh, is like, oh, I don't want to do that. I, I just want to sit at home and watch football. Um, but it's getting myself out of myself and reconnecting with the community around me. And that's what this, one of the great things about AA is it gives a community. No matter where I go, I have that community. So I moved from Colorado into here and you know, made friends right away. And anytime I travel anywhere for work or anything like that, like recently I was in Dallas 
I went to a meeting there, and they welcomed me right in. Um, I, I had to take a lift there, and it was raining and stuff like that. And <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the people there was like, "Hey, I'll give you a lift back to your hotel." Didn't know me from anybody. I'm from out of town, and just hooked me up with a ride. And I, that's awesome. You can't get that anywhere else. So, but you know, not everything's perfect, right? I still obsess over the future. <laughs> And regret the past. The past is not so much, but I'm always worried about the future. What's going to happen um, with the job or with my family? Just always try to get out of the present. It's like, it seems to be my baseline problem is that I can't live in the moment. <clears throat> and it becomes obvious. Uh, my wife will call me on it. Uh, we were in Traverse City, like, I think it was a month ago now. And I was getting pretty irritable, restless, irritable, and discontent. Um, and she was like, hey, uh, have you looked to see if there's any meetings around here? I was like, oh, I have not. I've meant to, and I haven't done that yet. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I think things got better after I went to a meeting. But it's real obvious. Like, my my shelf, shelf life is not very long without a meeting, and it's very clear that I need to be here and continue to work with others. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, like, I have to act my way in, into a new way of thinking, right? You can't think your way into a new way of acting. You have to act your way into a new way of thinking. Because my thinking controls my actions, right? And my thinking is always negative. That's the baseline. It's always negative. So <clears throat> I have to act in a different way in order to change it the other way, right? So, so I ask myself, when there's a problem or something that bothers me, what can I do about it right now? If the answer is nothing, I do my best to just let it go on by. But if there is something I can do, I act upon it and, you know, handle handle it the best way I can. Like, I don't always do the next right thing. I try to do the next thing right. Um, but the point is, if I don't let those things that I can't control or do anything about slide on by, they begin to pile up. And then they pile up and they pile up and they pile up. And then all of a sudden, I want to escape again. I want to escape this feeling, and that leads to drinking for me. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't know. The way the way I see it is, like, my alcoholism, my disease is like an escalator that is constantly going down. Okay? So, <clears throat> what what's down there? Right now, I feel like I'm fine, but as I keep going down, if I'm not doing anything to work my program, I start feeling irritable. I want to escape and go down further is the drink and what goes down further is I lose my family, I lose my career, I lose my friends, everything that's important to me, go down further is finally death. That's how it's going at all times. You know, the meetings are great in this program. The fellowship is great. But the menu, or sorry, the recipe on how to recover is right up there in those 12 steps. I have to be doing both of those things. I have to be doing service in addition to it. Because if I'm just going to meetings, which is great, and I'm just listening to podcasts and meditating, those kind of things, you know, I might be walking up the, that escalator just a little bit at a time, and overall, I'm staying about even. But eventually, I feel like I'm going to tire out, and I'm finally going to slide down. The only way to, you know, the only way is down, unfortunately. Um, so how do I get back up? And that's how getting new sponsees, working with newcomers, you know? That's the only way that I can work the program to where I'm taking steps up and working on progress instead of just like coasting, coasting down. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll briefly touch on the promises for me. Man, I can't even tell you how much better my life is uh, than it was two years ago. You know, about this time two years ago, I was circling the drain and, you know, I was about to meet that bloody booger. And now, <laughs> and now I'm here in Michigan. I have a great job. <clears throat> I'm a neurologist. I am about to have like a full, like actual attending job and be done with training here in the summer in July. That's why we're moving to Kansas City. Um, I have an eight month old baby at home, uh, my wife and my stepson. And, uh, and we just found out that we have another baby on the way. Uh, so two lives that would not have been possible if it wasn't for this program. So to wrap things up, if you're relatively new to this and you don't believe it'll work for you, maybe you can at least believe that it worked for working for me or working for people in this room. You start there, you have a shot. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. My name is Anthony, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.